Right, good evening everyone, and um, thank you very much for inviting me down to talk about Lockheed's. Um, it's, um, we've got had a few technical issues. I had I spent most of the morning sorting out my photos in exact order of what I was going to talk about, but unfortunately the Mac won't talk to this, so things have got a little bit out of order. So you just have to bear with me. The photos now are not going to quite correspond with what I'm saying, but we'll we'll persevere and we'll get through it. Um, so I thought I'd break my talk into sort of three sections, a little, a little bit my history, so because it, it, it sort of relates to the Lockheed quite a bit, um, and then a little bit about um, Lockheed itself, just because a lot of people might not know much about them, but I'll keep that fairly brief. And same with Union Airways, and then I'll go move into the um, the rebuild. So. I might have to, I've got a huge amount of notes here, so I might have to shorten things up and I could talk all night about the restoration because anyone that's done one will know exactly <laughs> what's involved. Lots. Lots, yeah. So, um, and I'm happy to take questions along the way, just feel free to put your hand up or yell out or something and I'll um, do my best to answer. Um, so my father, Bill, learned to fly at Auckland Aero Club in 1937, and um, so I was born up in a flying, brought up in a flying family. But um, I remember after he retired off the the four-engine Electra, we did. He must have got a bit of cash from me in New Zealand or something, and we did a big camping trip in in Europe, um, and came back to the third form, and, and it's, yeah, this vocational guidance thing was on one evening, and Dad took me along to that, and. I hadn't been at school for about a month because I'd been on holiday, so the guy, I still remember the guy is looking at my report card and he's looking down like this and he said, what do you want to be, son? And I said, oh, I want to be an airline pilot. And he said, oh, your, your maths is terrible, your English is terrible, French is terrible, <laughs> everything was terrible. So he didn't say how I could change this or how I could become an airline pilot. And I, all I remember is getting in the car with Dad driving home, he said nothing. <laughs> so I just put it out of my head. I thought, well, that's just not going to happen. And I'm, to this day, I'm glad it didn't happen because I've done way better doing my own stuff without having someone you know, telling me where I've got to fly. So that, that's, um, I sort of put aviation out of my head for a long time and then I built a house in Devonport, finished all that, moved in and and my neighbour said, oh man, you, what are you going to do next? And I thought, oh, I might build a keeler or a boat or something. You know, I'd, I'd built boats when I was younger. And he said, have you ever thought about flying? And I said, well, I did briefly, but, you know, it's, I, I just never, never happened. And he said, oh, I reckon you should try it again. You know, like, just try it. So I went up to North Shore Air Club and did a trial flight. And I thought, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> it was it was better than I ever imagined. So I got bitten by the by the um, by the bug that was probably worse in my case than if, you know if I'd taken up a cocaine you know become a cocaine addict. But anyway, since then I, I, my first aircraft was a um, C model Mooney, which was one. It was an old Auckland Aero Club aircraft. And after I gained about 120 hours, I saw this ad somewhere for um, joining the London to Sydney Air Race, which was reenacting the old kangaroo route. And it, it's the DC-2 was obviously in that race much earlier on. So I thought, oh, I've just got to do this. This sounds like fun. And so I paid my deposit, and I thought, oh, you know, I'm not instrument rated or anything. I only had, I'm only PPL and VFR pilot, so. Um, the one it, one, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've flown it. Yeah, CPF. Yeah, well, I've just got on yeah, registration there. But yeah, quite a few people have flown that aeroplane. So um, I got in touch with my good friend Matt Wakelin, and he said, Yep, count me in. So off we went. We flew to London and then flew it all, or well, raced it all the way back. And um, so that's one of the highlights of my flying um, to date. Um, then I owned an Ovation for a while, it's the big Mooney, that's the 300 horsepower Mooney, which was the most awesome machine you could ever fly with that extra horsepower. Um, the Bird Dog, which has been mentioned, Stearman, which I bought unseen on eBay um, from a guy in Louisville. I don't suggest 
accept ever buying or recommend ever buying an aeroplane you've never seen, from a, especially from a dodgy guy in Louisville. <laughs> they have a fortune the, the, the Kiwis took care of the restoration and brought it up to what it should have been. And the Yak 52, and which got sold to Warbirds, and then Carol and I have just we bought another Yak out of Canada um, late last year, so we'll get back into the Yak again. Um, and then other things I've done is, uh, well, the same year, actually, 2001, I co-flew a Lockheed 12, which is the baby Lockheed, um, so it's a bit smaller than the Lockheed 10. So the Lockheed 10's 10 seats, and the, the 12 was developed um, as an executive version, so much like a Learjet of the day. And um, I could, it's a whole other story in itself, I could speak a whole other night on that one, but basically it was owned by a United Airlines captain and he said, oh, yes, he's having trouble finding someone to ferry it out here. So I said, well, well, pick me. And he said, would you do it? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even have a twin rating. But um, again, I went to the aid of Matt, and Matt said, yeah, shit, yeah, count me in. You know, so off we went to Moses Lake and picked up this Lockheed. And as I say, the rest of it's a, a whole other story. It had a, quite a few issues, which I think is the reason why the pilot didn't fly it here himself. Um, then I flew, I won the, um, the Australian Outback Air Race in 2007 in the Ovation, so that was a precision flying event, so that was um, flying within seconds from waypoint to waypoint. And then we got third in 2009, and it, um, my co-pilot then was Hub Volker, who's, who's been heavily involved in the restoration of the Lockheed. And then I was chairman of the Around New Zealand Air Race in 2004, so organising the race around New Zealand. Flying the Tasman about eight times, three times to Fiji, via Norfolk and New Caledonia, and yeah, as I said before, all on all PPL or VFR. <laughs> Although VFR by law, but not in practice. <laughs> so totally now I've got about 3,000 hours, 3,300 hours. So moving on to the Lockheed Company, because that's what you've come to hear about. Um, so Lockheed was set up by two Scottish brothers, um, Malcolm and, sorry, three brothers, Malcolm, Alan and Victor, um, both all self-taught engineers. Um, they taught themselves to fly in their friend's Curtis Pusher in 1916, so a long, long time ago. Um, incidentally, Lockheed is spelled L-O-G. Sorry, L O U G H E D, H E E D, but they decided it was a bit of a mouthful in states, and that's how it became L O C K. So it's um, slightly different spelling from their actual surname. Um, so after several company failures, I think there were about four failures before finally um, a guy by the name of Robert Gross and a group of San Francisco investors um, invested in Lockheed Number Three or Four, I think it was. Um, and then they had Lloyd Stearman join them. So Lloyd Stearman was the designer of the, the, the you know, Stearman by, by the biplane by the same name. So he already had a track record on aircraft design and production, and so he was appointed CEO of the company. So after they completed four Vegas, one Altair, and I think I've got some photos here if we can make this work. Um, where's the arrow key there? All right, no, we'll. Leave that there. Um, there are some photos in there. Um, they, they, they planned to go into much greater things, which was the Lockheed 10. So air transport was just starting to become of interest to the public, and they, they um, designed the 10-seat Lockheed. So it first flew on uh, 23rd of February 1934, so it's over 86 years ago. And um, the, it followed the... Um, it was a, sorry, the predecessor of the Orion, which I've just mentioned. So the fuselage and um, the sleek low drag fuselage and retractable gear and landing flaps were incorporated in the, in the new design. It's also the first all aluminium aircraft ever to be built. So the DC-3 and the Boeing 247 all had fabric control surfaces. So if you look at the rudder and the elevators and the, um, the ailerons of the DC-3, they're all fabric. So it was, a, you know, being first all, sorry, the first all metal air, airplane was quite a big thing in the, in the, at the time. Um, Lloyd Stem and Von Hake and Al Hibbard did the design work, so were Lockheed employees. Uh, initially the airplane had one fin and the, um, 
the rearward sloping windscreen, the same as the Boeing 247. And that was until they sent um, the, a, a model of the aeroplane across to um, a university in Michigan where uh, Kelly Johnson, a young engineer, aeronautical engineer, advised that they change the slope of the windscreen back to a more conventional car type slope and incorporate the twin fins. So that's, it was Kelly Johnson that was responsible for the twin fin design, which obviously went on to all most of their other models in the, in the early times, the Hudson and the Lodestars and the, um, even the Constellation. It had triple tail but still had the two fins outboard. Um, so Kelly ended up being long-time chief engineer for Lockheed after he'd left Michigan. Well, he's made an offer from um, Lockheed from Michigan University, and he's the founder of the Skunk Works. So that Skunk Works was responsible for a lot of uh, high-profile high-profile aeroplanes like the SR-71 and the U-2 and all those great things that Lockheed churned out in the uh, 50s and 60s. And as it turned out, uh, Lockheed's decision to uh, design a twin was a good one because shortly after the CAA or now the FAA um, ruled that only twin engine aircraft could carry passengers, fare paying passengers. So that sort of fell into their hands. So there were 149 Lockheed Electras built. Um, so 115 were for the airlines, seven for the US government, some to the Argentines. 25 went into private hands um, and it was the demand from private owners which drove the um, design for the Lockheed 12 which is the baby baby version I, I mentioned so that is here somewhere I saw a photo of that which that's the Lockheed 12 so that's the one we bought out from the States so it's just a little bit same engines well not quite the same engines. The most popular engine on the on the Lockheed 10 is the 985, the Pratt and Whitney 985. But there were other derivatives, but much lower usage. So uh, cruise speed of the Lockheed 10s around 200 miles an hour, 174 knots. Which, when Union acquired their aircraft in 37, it was faster than anything the RNZ AF even had at the time. It was the fastest aeroplane in the country. And there are four, four versions, um, but as I say, that were, it's only different power plants that, um, that define the, the different models. So today, still quite a few Lockheed 12s fly, gracing the skies. If you go to Oshkosh, you often find a lineup of about 10 Lockheed 12s, all beautifully restored and gleaming in aluminium. Um, but there are only two Lockheed 10s still flying in the world. So one of those is flown by Air Canada. Um, and unfortunately, airlines mostly are run by accountants these days. And um, I'm still in touch with the old Air Canada pilots. And I say, oh, are you taking it to Oshkosh this year? And they say, oh, no, we'd love to, but they won't let us, you know, they're not, they don't want to take any risk and they don't want us to spend any money on gas and, you know, blah, de, blah. And he says, it's all too hard, you know. So, the last I heard, someone in an ATR was, or an engineer in an ATR was doing a run-up on the, on the tarmac, not noticing the Lockheed was parked behind, blew the Lockheed into the hangar, smashed all the tail group up, and um, it's been, um, I think, about over a year being repaired. I think it's flying again now, but that's just, yeah, that's Air Canada. Um, and then the other aircraft which is back in the air is the original Barter Shoe Company aeroplane. So I didn't realise this, but Barter Shoes is a Czech company from Czechoslovakia. And Mr. Barter, who was big into aviation in 1937, purchased a Lockheed so that he um, could ferry high value workers and supplies to as many factories around Europe. So that, that was, this was used. I suppose a bit like a citation or a Learjet would be used for the car plants around De uh, Detroit, you know, carrying urgent supplies of you know small high-value items, and so he was. It was pretty advanced at the time. Um, in April '37, the Barta Electra made a probably what was um, the first successful round-the-world business trip as well. He, he used the Lockheed to go round the world, visiting various customers. And then just before the breakout of hostilities, it ended up taking a plane load of exec or barter executives to their freedom in England. 
and then after that it went through subsequent owners and ended up back with Bartha. So the guy that owns it now, he's like Mr. <coughs> Mr. Google of um, Europe. Very wealthy guy, um, made his money out of the internet. And the aeroplane flies quite regularly, so that's probably the, um, the one that's getting the most use. Um, so all the remaining Lockheed 10s around the world are static displays in museums. There's one in the London Science Museum, if you go in there it's hanging from the roof. There's one and a half in Motat, so the, um, the one in Motat is that's complete is actually BUT, it's not, um, um, not, not the real registration. And the bits are um, AFD, I think, it's, it's just a, a part, part fuselage. Um, never say never, but I think it's highly unlikely any others will fly apart from the one that I'm restoring. It's just, it's just too, too big a job, too expensive, and, um, and parts are getting quite, quite scarce as well. Um, I'll just, yeah, I'll just, I'm not too sure where these photos are at, so I'll just go into the Union Airways stuff and then we'll get into the nitty gritty. Um, so amongst much controversy, Union Airways received government approval to buy four Lockheed 10As in November 36. So this was a time that was by British. Um, the government of the day was quite insistent that we deal with the motherland and I don't know how Union got it over the line to buy Lockheeds, but they did. And the only thing I can think of is they were part of, um, well, the aircraft, um, or the airway airline was part of Union Steamship Company. And they probably had a lot of foreign currency from their activities around the world and were able to use the foreign currency to, to spend it as they chose. So I can only assume that that's how they ended up with them. Um, but the, the um, introduction of the Lockheeds completely uh, changed commercial aviation in New Zealand. It was much faster than the DH-89, and it gave the first ability to actually do a business trip to Wellington and back in, in one day, if you caught the early morning flight out, and back to Whanuapai in the afternoon. So the first to arrive were AFC and AFD. Um, unfortunately, AFC crashed at Mangere on the 10th of May, 37, which... Um, it was my father's birthday, he happened to be out there at the, at the time and that was a result of, an, a, I think, an engine failure where the aeroplane just rolled into the dead engine and into the ground. So there's a bit of AFC there, that's, um, that's off a tail fin off, off the aeroplane. I, a guy just put it into my hands, he said, I think that you should look after this. So I don't know where it came from or how he got to possess it. but. This turned out to be really useful um, when we were looking for the, for the exact Lockheed logo, which had changed over the years. It, they had many, many iterations of their logo, but this would have been put on by Lockheed at the Burbank factory, and the aeroplane was so young the colours wouldn't have changed, so we were able to use that as a, as a, um, a perfect graphic and to pick up that red, red colour. Yeah, yeah, I think Richard War put a memorial there. Hmm. Yeah, so. Um, looks like some enterprising engineer took a pair of tin snips there, and yeah. Well, but anyway, so uh, that was yeah. So that's uh, AFC, and then. Um, AFD crashed uh, about a month later. AFE arrived in NZ and, and um, this one flew until 1942 until it ploughed into the side of Mount Richmond near Nelson. AGG arrived, uh, oh, sorry, AGJ arrived in 38 and flew for 10 years before crashing here in the, at Tauranga Harbour. And I think the part of the aeroplane was in the old hangars down here for years before someone had to tidy up and, and threw it all out. AGK arrived one, one month later and crashed into the side of Mount Ruapehu um, in 1948. And then ALH was imported for Australia in 46 and ended up being broken up for scrap, so it's one that didn't crash. Um, and then another replacement was, was brought in from Australia. So the, the aeroplane got a bad rap, but not because of the aeroplane. It's, it's a really tough little aeroplane. It's beautifully built. and. It was just that uh, um, I remember my father telling me it was just the, the period they were flying, and there was very little navigation aids. 
often the weather you were handed as a pilot was not accurate, and that's how the Mount Ropehu accident happened. They were they actually drifted, I think, about 20 to 30 degrees off off their the track they intended to fly. Um, and I know my old man. I think it was through what had been through this association actually, or Air League, or one of the one of those was trying to get the um, the pilots cleared of any wrongdoing because it was it was put down as pilot error. But in actual fact, um, the information they're using was was totally incorrect, and they couldn't have known any better about it. So. Anyway, by um, the late 40s, war surplus DC-3s and Lockheed Low Stars were, were plentiful and cheap, and that, that really put an end to the, to the, the baby Lockheed. And now for the bit you've come to hear. So that's, that gives you a bit of background about me and, and Lockheed. Um, so the aircraft I purchased um, was built in 1941 and serial number 1145. So it's 1145 out of 1149. It was one of the last to be built. So. This was war wartime production. I don't know how they fitted in, but fitted it in because they were also producing, at the time, around about 900 Lightnings and a lot of Hudsons and a lot of other stuff. So it was a, a period of huge expansion for for Lockheed. Um, so it was part of an order comprising of six L10s for Land Chile. So it went to, um, brand new down to Land Chile in Santiago. Um, it's, uh, I think Land's experience was similar to that of, of, the, of Union pilots. Um, they were often flying an IMC and they also found the little Lockheed slightly underpowered. Um, the early aircraft had two-speed props which couldn't be feathered, so this all presented a problem on the rare occasion that you had an engine failure or had to shut down an engine. So apart from that, pilots I've spoken to who flew the baby electras have all stated what a joy they are to fly. So the aircraft I've got, it um, has about 11,000 hours on it, um, and that was between 41 and 1960 when it finished airline service. And um, I'm sure it's t carried a lot of famous people and been around the Andes, and you know, it'll be interesting to see where, where it actually went, but um, I think mainly, mainly around Chile. Um, an interesting side story is um, I went to Chile about oh, it would be 20 years ago now, trying to see if they had any information or surplus parts or anything like that, and they had, they had none. But I did did get to meet one of their old pilots, Alfonso Marino, who who told me a lot about their flying activities and basically going into a lot of unimproved gravel strips and this that sort of thing all over over um, Chile. Um, but he was saying the um, telling me about one time the the chief pilot said, look, you're looking a bit stressed, you've been working hard. He said, why don't you take, take one of the aeroplanes with your family and just, we'll pay the gas, just take it away for a week. <laughs> so imagine that in a 777 or something, just take, <laughs> take the 777, take your family, you look, you know, you, hopefully you'll be a bit refreshed when you get back. So, um, but that's the way it all worked back then. Um, so when Land Chile finished with the aeroplane in 1960, it, it was purchased by an American airline pilot, and um, he flew it up to Alaska, um, where I can only assume it was going to be used for, for carrying salmon or something to do with the pipeline. So often they bought these, these um, you know, aeroplanes that had finished their commercial life and, and just took all the seats out and used them for humping freight or fish. Or, but obviously that never came around, and it sat at, um, at um, Homer Airport up there uh, on the ground and racked up $4,200 worth of parking fees. So uh, clearly the airline pilot must have run out of money or something and didn't pay, so they impounded the aeroplane and they gave it to the Museum of Alaska Transport and Industry. So that is a museum very like MOTAT. Um, based in Wasilla, Alaska. Um, the museum had a highly unsuccessful open day and lost a lot of money. And the Lockheed was one of their um, highest priced assets, if you like, or exhibits, but with the least amount of Alaskan history because it had just arrived there, hadn't done anything in Alaska, it just turned up. So. I don't know to this day why, but one night in bed I was reading Trader Plane, 
And I don't know why I looked under Lockheed, but I did. I wasn't actually looking for one. I owned the DC-3, which is parked at the back here at that time, and I didn't need another big aeroplane. But on looking through, I saw a Model 10 Electra, and I thought, wow, that's pretty rare. <laughs> Not unusual to be <laughs> just a little weenie ad in a in trader plane. So I looked at the time, and I thought, oh, I'll get up in the morning and ring Alaska and, and see what it's about. So I got onto the curator and I said, oh, is this, is this a Lockheed 10? He said, yes, sir, yeah, it's a 10, you know, it's blah -de blah And I said, I'll be there tomorrow. So I booked a flight on Air New Zealand to LA and then on to Alaska and I was there the next morning. Hired a car, went up to Wasilla and um, we'll find the photo somewhere in here. It's unfortunately the order's out now, so I had them all, I could have stepped through, but... Um, No, we'll, we'll have to come to it. It's, it's gone to the back of the uh, back of the queue. Um, so I flew up there, and I still remember seeing it for the first time. And it was just sitting outside with grass growing underneath it. Um, the lawn mowing tractor had gone into a wingtip. Something else had taken out an elevator. The rear door was hanging off it. Um, the nose was smashed in because I'd left a DC-3 wing lying on the ground and the wind had caught that and blown into the Lockheed's nose. Um, half the windows had fallen out and it just looked sad. I mean, it was just... I, and I think that's why I bought it. I just felt sad for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if no one saves us now, it's, it's, it's gone, yeah. And, um, so I remember uh, you had to go back to the office and they had a little brown envelope. You had to put on a little slip of paper what you wanted to pay and put that in there and I thought, put in the little box for the tender box. Flew back to New Zealand and um, anyway, about a week later, I, it was the days of fax because this is 1996 I'm talking about. This is quite a few years ago now. And um, the fax, ma fax machine turns into life. Um, when are you going to pick up your aeroplane and here's the account to send the money? So I thought, oh shit, yeah, like, <laughs> I didn't think I was had a chance of actually winning it. So um, anyway, I sent the money and um, at that time I was flying out of North Shore a lot and I knew Stan Smith who'd flown with my dad as he was a flight engineer and um, so when I saw Stan I said, what the hell do I do, what do I, you know, how do I get this thing back here? And he said, oh look Rob, I'll come with you, well let's, let's go up there, I'll bring my tools and, and we did. So we flew up there. And um, the first, the, pl the plan was, we did, we, you know, we looked at all the measurements and everything, and the plan was to take the outer wings off, take the props off, take the tail fins off, weld up a, a, a steel rack that would fit onto a flat rack container, and weld in some wheel cups to hold the wheels and a place to tie down the tail, and ship it home. You know, it's easy. So, that was until we started making some inquiries. So we'd already started pulling things off and, and um, so, and we've started to organise where we're going to get this container or this flat rack container because they're pretty, not as common as the others. And, um, and then the guy said, well, how wide's the load? And I said, oh, it's 18 foot six. And he said, well, mate, you're going to have a trouble because the roll on roll off boat, which goes down to Seattle, has only got an 18 foot door. So I thought, oh, hell. So, Next thing, started talking to some other people and they said, well, you could probably truck it to Valdez and that's 150 miles from Wasilla and ask the US Navy if you can use their barge and crane and then get a barge from Seattle and take it down that way. So I was starting to think, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not Mr. Google. <laughs> and I rang up the um, police department to find out what it was going to cost to get the escort for the truck to go to Valdez, and, and I started adding it up. And I thought, "Holy crap! This is this, this is not this is not good. This is not how it was meant to be." So we got as far as we could in the week that Stan and I were up there, and flew home a bit despondent, thinking, you know, disgusted on the it was probably a DC-10 coming home in those days, or a 747 or something. And um, had a chat about it, and Stan said, "Well, they got the damn centre section in there. You know, it must come out. You know." So we went to Motat and had a look, and sure enough, it's all riveted and bolted in. So we thought, "Well, we'll go back and um, 
we'll take it out. So second trip on the 23rd of November, this is 96. Um, we'd already talked to someone, fortunately it was a little airport down the road, and we'd managed to secure a hangar down there for, um, because it needed to be undercover. October, oh, sorry, November in, in Wasilla is snowing every day. So I'll show you some photos when we get to it. So the second trip um, involved removing all the control cables, all the flat drive shafts, fuel tanks, hundreds of rivets, um, and we built up a, um, a, a rig, had to get some machinery from the museum, old antique forklifts and things they, they said we could use, stropped up the fuses, went to pull it out of the centre section after we checked and triple checked and anyway finally it went bang and really jerked out of the, and it was hanging up on one rivet. So it makes you realise what how strong a rivet is in shear and the diameter of the river is an eighth of an inch and it just scored right up the <laughs> but it, let, it did let go and we built a cradle for it and um, um, packed it all up in containers and got it ready to ship um, then we realised that the centre section which was we'd mounted um, trailing edge up out of a, a container that had no roof was too high for the roll on roll off slip ship and we were departing the next day so unfortunately we had to get the tin snips and just chop the whole thing off. We had no option at that point. We are just out of time, out of uh, everything and it, it was something that could be fixed. Then on the last day the, the, um, the guy at Ray's aircraft, the hangar, we get a phone call and a fax and this guy saying he's taking legal action against us uh, to stop the aircraft being removed from Alaska. So I think, oh god, now I'm going to need a lawyer. <laughs> so, fortunately, I don't know how, I, can, I just can't, I mean this was 24 years ago, I just can't remember how we got around it, but we did. And it was just a, a, a good feeling when that happened, because I thought, oh, we've got to fly home and, this, and we're going to have to make a third trip. So we, we um, got that sorted out, slammed the container's door shut, jumped on a plane to meet with NZ1 coming home, covered in grease and oil. And we didn't even have time to, to shower or change, and I don't know who was sitting next to us, but they certainly wouldn't have enjoyed it. Then I get home and um, everything's underway, it's all coming out here. I get another fax at home, and um, this time it's from a guy. He said, um, well, here you bought the Lockheed, and I was, you know, went back by fax, and he said, you might want the data plate for it, because <laughs> we didn't realise the, the data plate, which is the aeroplane, was not on it. So that was another bit of luck that this guy contacted me and um, he said, I'll email it down to you. So that's been in safe keeping. And <laughs> so, that, that, that's, so that gets the aeroplane to New Zealand anyway. So that's the, this is where the fun really starts and where do you start? Um, to that, up until that time I'd built a house, I'm really familiar with building boats and woodwork and that sort of thing but I've never worked on an aluminium aeroplane. And it requires different tools, different methodology, different everything. And it was like learning you know, to be practical all over again, but with a, in a diff totally different way. Um, and I quickly realised there was nothing DIY about building an aeroplane. And um, when I did get involved, I was just always given the shittiest job, so that was like scrubbing its bum and getting the, the, the primer off the rivets with acetone running down your hands and arms and all those jobs I ended up with but um, I, I, I remember building houses and you think pink, pink bats, you know putting pink bats in a ceiling or something is bad but this was ten times worse. Um, so anyway at first because I'd sold AWP, the aeroplane is sitting at the back there to New Zealand Aerial Mapping and they owed me some money. They, we did a deal where they would do some restoration on the Lockheed and I thought, well, I don't know. I know you do a lot of maintenance, maintenance on aeroplanes, but um, I'm not too sure what you'd like be like in restoration. And I didn't know Wild Denim and Pioneer and McSweeney or any of those guys back then. Um, 
So I thought, I'll, uh, fortunately, I had the, the foresight to just send them a few parts. And I said, look, start with these and um, we'll see how you go. Anyway, clearly they knew nothing about restoration and what came back was almost worse than what had gone down there. So I pulled the pin on that and talked to a lot of people and got talking to Wall and Colin Denham. So Colin Denham, um, as a very young apprentice, worked on the flagstaff, or the, the, the blocky that crashed into the... Into the um, well, just north of Dunedin, I think it was Flagstaff Hill. And um, so he knew a lot about them, and he was working with his son, Wall. So um, I sent the centre section down to Rotorua, where they were based at the time. And they did a pretty good job on that, but I realised this is such a big job that if I gave them the whole lot, it would take them years before they would finish. So I sent the outer wings to um, McSweeney at um, Pioneer at Ardmore, and they started working on the outer wings, which also turned out to be a, a, a big job. So things were progressing, and the fuselage was in my North Shore warehouse, so that was you know quite a long, thin fuselage, still in the jig, straight out of the container. It was there for years, waiting for its turn in the in the in the line to be uh, worked on. So in 1999, I. I um, um, it was becoming apparent we we're going to need some some bits to make this thing work and some bits that were difficult to make yourself. So I'm just glad I went when I did because you wouldn't even find this stuff now. Um, so in 1999, I uh, showed my dad a trip to Oshkosh because he'd never been there and I thought he'd really enjoy that. And I think I bought a United 10 pass or something so you could just flick around different cities, get a rental, go into these wrecking yards and um, <laughs> aircraft dealers and... Um, so there's one of them there, that's AB, this guy here. And I still remember walking into AB's office and he said, you must be Rob. And I said, yep, yep, I'm Rob. He said, I hope you got plenty of cash in that wallet of yours. <laughs> <laughs> so from AB, he, um, he was in San Antonio and um, so I managed to get two brand new shock struts. So these are the um, the undercarriage, the main undercarriage parts of the Lockheed that so take the the, um, the main load. You, it would be, you could build this, but it would be a massive job. And um, I managed to get two complete exhaust rings, so they're not, that's not all shown there, but they, they, you just can't buy those now. You know, they just don't exist. Um, retract screws brand new in the brown paper wrapping for the undercarriage retract. Um, Oh, and this, yeah, so this, we're on to Amelia Earhart now, but we'll cover that later. Um, so I managed to get a lot of, lot of stuff, and um, up, I also managed to get a lot of engine parts. So I went to a guy, he originally had 6,985 cylinders brand new in the military cans. He had about 30 left when I got there, and I said, I'll take 20. <laughs> he also had two brand new crankshafts, which you, can't, you just cannot buy them for, for a 985 now and master rods, so a lot of stuff, but if you tried to do this now, you just, you'd be fresh out of luck, you'd have to use, use stuff. Um, so I brought all this back, and then I thought we're going to need a big hanger to finish this project. So at the moment it was all in bits, but it was, at some point it was going to come together. So we had to build a 10,000 square foot hanger at Ardmore. Um, the reason it was 10,000 square feet is that was the land size, so I thought well, I might as well make the hangar as big as the land. There's no point in having <laughs> lawns to mow around your edge of your hangar in the weekend. Um, so it's better that it was concrete. And that's when we um, have enter Hube Volker, so more commonly known as Hobie, because he's Dutch and a bit hard to say Hube. Um, so Hobie had been working for Pioneer and, and while he'd worked for all the, all the guys, but I think he just had worked on the, on the wings at Pioneer and I don't know, we'd got to talking a lot and I think he just, I don't know whether he liked me or what was going on, but he said, are you looking for an engineer to finish it? And I said, well, I haven't given it any thought, but yes, I do need one. And he said, would you consider me? And I said, yeah. So that's... Hube came on, like, it's probably 16 years ago now. So the wings and centre section were all finished and we were starting to get into the tail group and then start you know, the uh, fuselage. And Hube and I looked at it and I said, well, how long do you reckon? He said, oh, I think we'll knock it out in three years. So 
Um, I said, well, that's good, okay, well, three years, that's fine by me. So that was 17 years ago. <laughs> and we still haven't finished. So, but Hub, he's the greatest guy. And, and you know, I think with these projects, every, you've just got to get a bit of luck every now and then. And that was my luck, finding him. Now, well, he came to me, but it was, um, you just couldn't get a better guy. He's got a NZCE, he's bright and bloody good with his hands, and that's a, a very rare combination. Um, he, he can use any bit of machinery, or welding gear, or this, or a lathe, or milling machine, or anything, um, and competently. So, and, and you really do need it for restoration. You're always turning stuff, making this, building that, even if it's a jig, you know? So, um, anyway, um, the best way I can sum up the um, the project is, and we had one only two days ago, is about a thousand five minute jobs. So you look at it and you think, yeah, that's, we've just got to bolt that on there and bolt that and put that in and spray paint it and it's done. Wrong. So at best, it might take you a day if you're really lucky, but more likely weeks, months or a year. And it's just the way airplanes are. We had. Um, I mean, only the other day we were putting all the um, aileron control cables in, which are quite different from a more modern aeroplane because they use a chain around the two control yokes and that connects to a bridle, which connects to two bell cranks, which is, connects to more cables. All hand spliced? Yeah, hand spliced, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We had them in the hangar only yesterday fixing some, not fixing some stuff, we had to make some adjustments. but. Um, I mean, it's a recent example of just last week where um, I picked up some brand new bell cranks from somewhere, but no one noticed that what was originally an airplane was a part number diddy da di da di da but one of the ones that went into the starboard or port wing was a dash one bell crank. So we don't know because there is no information. So although I got all the drawings for the L10 from the Smith Smithsonian, they were all on microfish and I had them digitised for a great cost. But even then sometimes either the part number's blurry or the, or the dimensions are blurry and you have to really um, you know, guess some of it. You know? The original were all on tracing paper. Yeah, it? yeah. And that's all gone. So. That yeah, doesn't photograph. Yeah, and and uh, interesting, the the manuals are all um, detailed about stuff you're never going to need, but <laughs> but it's totally silent on stuff like even how to rig the ailerons. Um, so it's it just assumed that you were from that era, and someone would know where you ring the Lockheed factory, and they'd just tell you. So um, anyway, so uh, yeah, that's one that was we. Yeah, I've seen so Hobie's, oh, you know, we have this sorted you know, by lunchtime and then we're going to move on to this. And anyway, two days later, it's still, we're still baffled. We had John in and he said, well, it could be like this, could be like that. But it just shows how these things just blow out. And there's two guys on it for, well, half a week now. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then there's, uh, there's just countless things, like there's a lot of things like electrical fittings. Um, so in the 30s, it's pre-World War II, so, um, so World War II bought the big, big build quantities and that's um, where a lot of big names came out like Hamilton Standard and you know, Pratt and Whitney went big time and um, a lot of those people. So a lot of even electrical connectors were made by Alcoa, but the volumes for commercial aircraft back then were in the, you know, in the very low hundreds, like 149. So um, it was, wasn't until World War II that Amphenol and Cannon came along and started making in big numbers. So trying to get Alcoa fittings is like trying to find you know, the proverbial. And we ended up having to machine up a lot of connectors ourselves and actually buy pins and build, rebuild them. And it's, it's, it's just weeks and weeks of work. Um, you know, test fitting, disassembling, going and get the shells anodised so they're away for three weeks while the anodising man's doing that. They come back and get painted and, you know, six months later you, you're back to where you were plugging this damn connector in. Um, 
things like the, um, I'll just try and move onto these photos now. Um, so there's the, that's, that's the fuselage in the, um, in the new hangar by itself. And we started just stripping stuff out and that's a better view of what it, what it was like. So we were really lucky in that this one had been zinc chromated um, internally. And although it was pretty scoty on the outside, the inside was in pretty damn good order, and especially the main spar. So to rebuild the main spar would probably mean it would never fly again because it's such a massive job using extru extrusions which can't be bought anymore. Um, you could probably machine them up, but the cost would just be you know, beyond most people. So, um, oh, that's Lockheed's first. You know, this is much more recent. We might have to come back to these. So this is things like a main cabin door entry frame. So it's multiple compound curves, and aluminium doesn't tend to like, especially thicker aluminium, it was probably about 40 or 50 thou has got to be put around that buck that we built, or the mould. So you've got to use O-state, and it's really hard to work it round there. And um, so you can see there, that's, that's the bit that we were looking at. It goes right the way. It's a big U-channel, but it's all curved. And, and what a lot of people don't understand is the tolerance to do with aircraft. So we had, we've had a lot of instances where, um, well, for example, on the back of the flap, there was a, a folded piece of strengthening um, section. And it had a couple of folds in it, and um, it was too long for our bender, so we had to send it out to someone that had a like a, you know, 18 foot um, press. So you go there and you say, look, it's for an aircraft, and it has to be within um, two thou or something, or what, you know, like quite fine tolerance. Yeah, yeah, we understand. We know about about accuracy and that's all that sort of stuff. So this will be like a sheet of 40 thou material we bought which is oversized because it can't be joined so you've got to buy the long sheet. Well trying to get aluminium to New Zealand from the States is expensive and difficult. So um, we had one big pack of sheets come and it was all beautifully done on a big um, plywood crate. Plywood crate split open somewhere in transit, so some enterprising warehouse guy had got some four inch nails and banged them in right through every sheet of aluminium that was in there. So when we got it, after waiting months for the stuff, couldn't use bugger all of it. We could only use the edge of the, <laughs> the sheet. So then we order a whole lot more and wait for that to come. So then you, you know, you've got to move on to other stuff. So. With the, with the flaps, we send the material out to the guy and, you know, be careful, it's the only material we've got. Comes back, it's not only not straight, but way out of tolerance. And um, so he talked to the guy and said, look, this, this is useless. And he said, yeah, yeah, we did our best. I'll put my apprentice onto it and, you know. <laughs> and, and I said, well, yeah, but we can't use it. And now I've got to go and get another sheet from the States. So now we're months behind again on you know, waiting for this and expensive. So it was just multiple things like this. So um, it was just a lot of stuff we put out and it ended up being a problem despite the owner of the business saying that he clearly understood what we required. But they just, they really can't get their head around. Like John will know what I'm talking about. They just don't understand the tolerances that are required and the fact that if something's, you know, this is joined in here, you know, if it's, if it's, I don't know, a sixteenth of an inch out, it's, it, aluminium doesn't like being twisted into place. It's not like a piece of wood. But. So um, accuracy was, was a biggie. Um, I'm now chopping around a lot. I'll just talk to the photos, I think, now. So this was a, another area where... Um, the window frames in the Lockheed are all wood. So much like an old Daimler car or... Um, so I've actually got one here that's... You can pass these around if you want. It's, um, so that's, that's a bit of the original there. And it's ten laminations thick. It's got a, a shoulder up here and then it's got a curve there to, to take up the shape of the window. So it's actually quite difficult to make. 
um, especially because it's got that shoulder which follows around. So having done a fair bit of woodwork, I tried. So this is my first jig that I made. Um, and what we underestimated was we made all these blocks with rubbers on them, all the different diameters as the, as the laminations came up. But the clamping force required to get a good join was so great that it bent the, the custom wood frame. So it was just throw it all out, start again. So this is like six months of... Um, so we then went to, hopefully it's the next photo, yeah, jig number two. Quarter inch, well, no, it's actually thick, and that's an eight mil steel base. <laughs> um, a lot of t toggle clamps, and rather than clamping, not, rather than packing the wood from the inside, we decided this time we'll go from the outside and build it up that way. So the end. The wind is the same. Ah, uh, fortunately, yes. <laughs> so that's the original, and that's that's what we ended up um, building, and. That's as close as we could get to the original. Yeah, just, just to let you know, that's that's the dining room. Yeah. So that was in the dining room for over a year because I could only do at best one lamination a day. It's ten per window times ten windows, plus two for spares. So 120 days at, at the very best. And, and in winter it slowed down because the epoxy wasn't going off so fast. So. Rob, you're saying you're making a lot. Ten I million. presume this means that the pieces that were there, like the window frame, were Rotten. usable. Yeah, that, that's exactly what is in John's hand. Right, they're just rotted. Just rotted, yeah. Um, so because the windows had come out, of the, some of the windows were oh, missing, right. yes. yeah, the weather had got in there. and um, So... Oh, this was a pioneer, so this is the outer wing section. Um, and yeah, again, fortunately everything was chromated, so it was actually in pretty good shape. There wasn't a heck of a lot to do. That's actually the original wings being made in the Lockheed factory. So not much different, you know, just a, our jig's probably a little bit different, but did the same, same thing. Um, I'll come back to that. Well, actually, I'll talk about this now. I'll talk about it now. So, the, when you're doing a restoration like this, it's a bit like Marty's aeroplane. What, you know, it's like the Gilmore thing. You could do this, or you could do that, or you could, um, you know, I don't know if Mr. Rockefeller owned it, you could do it in his colour scheme. Or So, I decided that uh, the aeroplane had been mainly used by Land Chile, and by absolute chance, um, and the, and the reason why it was originally going to take three years and not the 20 is because um, we originally we were only going to change the aluminium panels that had dents or scratches in it. And we started with that and then the new aluminium that was polished before it was put on, because you had to polish it before it goes on the aeroplane, looked so much better than the existing that we thought, ah, oh, it's going to look like a, like a, a mess. So then we thought, well, we want to be polished, but maybe we should paint it. So if we'd just painted the aeroplane in silver, it would have been finished and flying probably 15 years ago. But the polishing is such a massive job um, for every little sheet. Um, and it's already curved, so you've got to rest it on um, blankets and pillows and everything, because the, the, the actual polishing process actually is quite firm on the aluminium. Before you do any riveting. Before you do any riveting. Otherwise, you can't polish well that's another story. <laughs> so, which I'll, I'll just flick to now. The, the, um, we decided to, to paint um, the underneath of the aeroplane. So you can't actually see it. It's so well matched that you can't actually see it. But anyway, we didn't have a paint booth big enough, so we sent the wings to Pioneer. Yep, no problem, we can do that for you. We gave them the paint. And um, um, anyway, they um, they sprayed it, but they um, the I don't know what the hell they were doing or thinking or whatever it was, but it was just full of dust and grit. So, and I'd already put the clear coat on, and we thought, well, it's just not good enough. Yeah, you know, we're not. It's not the quality standard we're after. So, 
I remember driving my tractor and trailer over there and picking it all up and they were all like, you know, not talking to me and, you know, they never sent a bill, fortunately, because it would have, you know. But I just remember near, then spending the whole of January with 600 or, you know, 1,000 wet and dry paper, sanding two whole undersides of the wings in and out between each rivet, and the rivets are like an inch apart. And it was just a, you know, you get these hell jobs. It, it's, um, and it just sets you back. It's a month I could have been doing something else. But anyway, so what we, to do with logos, that's the Lockheed house colours there. So that stripe there was a Lockheed house colour. And so a lot of airlines, including Union, just adopted that Lockheed scheme, which is coincidentally, obviously, the red colour there off the, so we knew that that was the original colour. Um, and then by looking at various drawings and things you can pick up the rivet lines like this yeah. so you think oh it goes to that one two the, just past the third rivet right and usually on aeroplanes everything's either an eighth of an inch quarter of an inch half an inch or one inch so like the the, the black stripe is a quarter of an inch <laughs> so it's a lot of detective work and so that was all pretty straightforward, and then we, because originally we were going to um, use the existing skins, we got Aquamax to come and blast all the paint off the aeroplane. When they blasted the paint off, it perfectly left Area Linea Nacional, which is LAN, for LAN Chile. So we got some tracing paper, traced that off, digitised it, and um, we thought, shit, we'd better keep this in case we use it. And I was thinking, well, they owned the aeroplane the longest for 20 years flying in commercial service. It really should be LAN, but I wanted to also reflect the, um, um, the New Zealand side. So the other side is in Union Airways. So I'll come to the Union bit in a minute. We're just moving around here. That's the instrument panel, which we've kept... Um, Interestingly, the original panel, you had things like air, captain's airspeed would be over here, but the clock would be in front of you. It was, it was before, um, before CRM, <laughs> and um, it was just odd, an odd mixture of stuff. So we've got all the same instruments, but we've just done the traditional six-pack as where you'd normally look for airspeed or altimeter or... Um, so all the instruments went to the States and got refurbished and refaced. And um, so a really good guy in Seattle that did that. So the only modern instruments, we avoided putting a big Garmin screen in there because I think it just ruins um, an aeroplane like this. But we have got two circular um, EGT CHT gauges. So it's giving us um, cylinder head temperature and exhaust head gas temperature on every cylinder so and, and fuel flow so it just sort um, that was a safety thing all uh, right so the seats were all with the airplane which is extremely unusual normally these airplanes if they're going to hump salmon the seats end up in someone's hangar all thrown in the corner um, or worse go into the skip and disappear or they use for parachute dropping, all the seats come out and they again the corner of the hangar and then gone. But all the seats were in the aeroplane. But unfortunately, they were just a bit too far gone to re chrome. It would have taken so much work getting the frames right that we thought, oh, we'll make new frames. So when you say it like that, it's easy. But the amount of jigging and tooling that went into making those, so you got. No, I think that bracket there is like about a hundred thou, but it's got a joggle in it. Well, you're not going to do that in a vice. So, you know, that was about $4,000 to make a tool to accept that little piece and bend it with the joggle. Um, but it was the only way we could do it. Yeah. <laughs> but it was either that or just bodge it up. And I said to Hope, we are not bodging anything up. This is going to be as identical as we can make it. So... Even the knob on the seat there, little knobs, these are like a little bear coloured thing, they're slightly transparent. And um, so I built a little tool, which is in here, mm. just a little um, metal tool with a silicon. So 
Yeah. Well, that was the first one out of the mould, so that's what they look like when they're finished, just to wind the... But, yeah, those, some of them were cracked, some were missing, and you can't buy them, so... Um, and you could turn them up on a lathe out of aluminium or something, but it wasn't original, so... Um, so just, you know, it's one thing making the mould, but then you've got to muck around using resins and using a syringe to, to figure out exactly what dosage you need to get that colour. So, again, things like knobs can take months just before they're finished. Um, so that's the Barter airplane in, in Czech Republic. So it, it, it's not bad, but it's not up to what the extent that we've gone to. They were probably flying a lot, lot quicker and a lot earlier, but it's um, um, it's not quite there. I mean, even the black, the black under the stripe is missing, and they've just done it. They've got it most of the way there. Um, oh, there's so there's a window frame there. That's before we varnished it. it was just a pre-fit with some wedges in there and. Um, so the seats were done by um, a guy in Balclutha who um, John Eaton, um, Air New Zealand pilot, put me onto. And I'm thinking, shit, Balclutha, what the hell is it? It's miles away. So he said, no, if you want good seats, go and see John. So I rang him and he said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that for you. And so I sent them down and I'd given, I must have given them such a bloody speech. I said, John, I've heard you're good, but these have to be better than good. I'm after perf absolute perfection. And he said, Rob, yeah, I, th I, think, I think I can do that for you. So anyway, it was Christmas time. He rings me. He said, um, I've finished two, but he said, I'm a bit reluctant to do the other eight until you see them because I just want to make sure that my perfection is the same as yours. So I got my bird dog at about 5.30 in the morning, got to Balclutha at lunchtime, raced up the road. I said, John, that's spectacular. I, I, I was just blown away by his workmanship. Jumped back in the bird dog, got back to Ardmore about six o'clock. <laughs> but um, he, we then flew him up and he did all the cabin interior, all the, all the wool lining, the whole lot, because he was, um, we borrowed a sewing machine from some mate of his and put it in the hangar. And, um, so this is not most recent, this would be a couple of years ago. Um, the airplane's always covered in sheets because you get dust on the aluminium and it just starts corroding straight away. Oh, window frames, laminations, um, wingtips, another huge problem. Um, so the wingtips, if you look at a Beach 18, they did it the easy way, the skins just come round to that point and they just capped, put a capping strip. Not Lockheed, they're all press skins and they go around like that. So a real bugger to rivet, a even bigger bugger to make, like you, almost impossible to make without a, a big tool. So. That's that be made in the oak condition and heat treated. Uh, no, so that's an original Lockheed replacement skin from the factory that I picked up from somewhere. And that's pressed out by some humongous press because there's the waste material and it's. Um, uh, you just can't. Rubber press, yeah. Yeah, you know, but, a, but a extremely large one. I saw one at um, De Havilland's in Sydney. They were. Uh, De Havilland's huge factory at Bankstown. Yeah. They had a rubber, 200 ton rubber press. Yeah. And at the time it was being used for pushing out sides for aluminium boats. Yeah. And pressings for Victor motor mowers. Yeah. Yeah. Victor were building airplanes across the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, we use ours a lot you know, for yeah. pressing frames and. Um, but yeah, this one just had too much rash. We just couldn't. Um, it didn't actually get used in the end. But anyway, so. It is extremely hard to find anyone to, with the skills to handle aluminium. It's, um, so the, guy, the guys that did the nose of the aeroplane, there was a guy called um, Red in Los Angeles. He'd done his apprenticeship at Lockheed um, in the 30s. And he was over 90 when I started using him. And I used to get in the rental car and off, get off the plane in LA and take my stuff there. And you bang on the door in a little shed, you know, and, Oh, he's not there. He said he'd be there. I sent him a fax, yeah, and he said I'll be there that day. <coughs> you know, you bang, 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 bang. Finally, you hear some scuffling, 
And he had a mattress in, the, in, the, in his little workshop. Because he's, oh, I'm, oh yeah, I'm 90, Rob. Yeah, I can't do a whole day. I've got to have my, <laughs> got to have a sleep. <laughs> but he said, I've got too much work. He said, these guys bring P51 stuff, and you're here, and everyone wants everything urgently, and, I, and there's only just me. <laughs> but anyway, poor old Red passed away. I think, you know, and that was a huge loss to everyone getting this sort of stuff done, because he had a, a massive double beam hammer, like, so two guys could work on this thing. Um, and I remember him doing the, the he did the, the, the nose bowl for me. What, he said, look, when are you flying back? And I said, well, tonight. And he said, look, I'll do it now. I'll, I'll get these, you can take them home tonight with you. So I'm thinking, well, yeah. And he's there and he's like this, offering it up to the original head, offer it up to the original. Is that what you want? <laughs> and I was, seriously, it was almost that quick. And just by eye, I was, I was up there thinking, man, you know, it's just, I don't know how you do it. So, but these guys are gone. You know, they're, you know, Colin Denham's gone, Red's gone. Um, a lot of the guys that have worked on this are no longer with us, unfortunately, but they were the ones with the knowledge and the skills to... Um, so there's the cabin, a bit more advanced. We, 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 we put um, soundproofing throughout, so the big pillows we've made, sealed pillows, all custom made to fit every single, every single one of those spaces is different from the others. So mammoth job just doing that, but... Um, they wouldn't have been like that originally? No, no, they had um, some sort of wool that was about a quarter of an inch thick, and I'd use some horrible glue, which, and when I saw it, I actually, I sent it out to a testing place, it might have asbestos in it, it just looked real nasty. Yeah. Unfortunately, it didn't, but it required copious amounts of acetone to move it, you know, and you're just scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing. You know what it's like. Windows. So the aeroplane only had one original window in it, and the glass is laminated. So it's one piece of glass, plastic like a car windscreen, and then glass. The total thickness was, I don't know, about you know, like four and a half mil. Which means each pane of glass was like 332 or something like that. So you start ringing around the states looking at glass people that bend glass, so eh? Sir, so you, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You can't make it that thin. And I said, well, I've got a piece in my hand and I've got the locky drawing which specifies the thickness. And they were making them in 1930, so, or 34. No, nah, no, nah, it's not possible. It's not possible. So you'd ring the next guy, you know, no, no, you, you know, you just, that's too, too hard, you can't do that, and blah, blah, blah. So finally found someone in Sydney, Australia, and they were doing architectural stuff. And the guy said, yeah, we, we can't make it quite as thin as you want, but we can get pretty bloody close. So um, all that required with an increased glass thickness was to make the wooden window frame a fraction narrower, and it, it would, you know, the net result was the same. When, they, when this glass was cooling, um, when they, they got the right radius, so it's a huge radius, like about, I forget how big, like a couple of metres is the arc. That, and it's a constant radius through there. But they've also got to heat it to bend it. And when it cools, the, the, the corners just tuck up a little bit. And, but you can be certain when Lockheed did it, in the, in, the, in the 30s, there were a lot of immigrants from Europe. So the guys that probably did the window frames were probably piano or guitar or violin makers from Vienna or something that immigrated to the States. And the glass people were probably Venetians from Italy or something that knew a lot about glass. And they would have made a mould that, that compensated for the tuck and when it cooled. So when it cooled, it cooled flat you know, or straight. Anyway, it wasn't too bad. And um, oh, it's, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll come across the other photo, but we, we managed to use um, we used a, a modern system of bonding, like a, a modern car windscreen, into um, into a frame, and um, that's worked well. The original was a rubber seal and never sealed properly. So, how are we for time? Were you all right? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So there's the nose that the DC-3 hit. Doesn't look like much, but there was a major, major lot of work um, fixing that. That's instruments. 
the nose cone that Red made for me. Well, he made the skins. And then, this is my work here, we, the control wheels were cracked. So it's got an aluminium subframe underneath here. And then they moulded a black stuff. I don't know what the hell it was because I ground it off and there was just clouds of black dust coming off it. But because it was cracked, we were worried that there might have been corrosion that got you know, migrated through the crack and you don't want your control wheel breaking while you're in flight. So ground it all off and then we had to find a way, we had one, we kept one good one that we had and made a mould so that we could use black epoxy to, um, to, um, to recover them. So, but that's just a small part of the mould, it, it ended up being a big silicon mould and a big metal box. So it's fairly advanced there on the, um, so they're back to logos. Um, there are no colour photos of that anywhere that I can find. So this is from the 30s and I've spoken to numerous, numerous people and they're all black and white photos. So all you can do is tell that the shade of that colour is darker than that one. So you don't know if it's black or red or... So after a lot of discussion, that's what we did. Um, and again, we picked up the typeface just by rivets by looking at, you know, that's the halfway point between that one and that one and it fits in there and just figured it out and drew it up. That's identical to the Union Airways um, thing, again, by picking off rivets. That's the netting for the overhead luggage things. So if you looked at the barter aeroplane, they would have gone into the place where Audi goes to buy the stuff on their back seats and bought a roll of that and just sewn it up and it just looks terrible. I mean, it's machine made, it looks shocking. So I used to go up to Hong Kong a lot on business, so I'd go around the markets looking for three core, one eighth inch cotton <laughs> cord. So after about the third hit, I found it and um, then we found the Lockheed drawing which showed, um, you know, it's like a one inch by one inch triangle were knotted there with a specific you know, netting knot. So I tried doing it at home by putting nails in a board and doing my you know, macrame thing and I thought, oh, I haven't got enough life to, to do all this. Got on the internet, found a woman in Maine who used to sit on her grandmother's knee while she was repairing fishing nets and rang her and said, would you be interested in, in a unique little project? And she said, sure, send it up. And she did a, a magnificent job of them, I just like the originals. Rubber press for stamping out, you know, frames, and there's a little bit of frame there. Um, engines, so as I said, I managed to get brand new parts, all the hard to get stuff, and then from Sun Air Parts and a couple of other big distributors in Los Angeles, I got all the other parts, all brand new. So. The, the engines I have would be the last two Pratt & Whitney 985s ever to be built out of brand new parts. So all, all the others have either got used crankshafts or used this or used that. But this is entirely new. I didn't trust sending it all to America to get made up because you can't tell whether you got your crankshaft back in your engine. So I used Quentin down at Field Air who I've known for years. He did a lot of DC3 stuff for me. You know, I knew if I gave it to Quentin, at least my stuff would come back to me. And if there was a problem, I could just call him on the phone. So that's the last two 985s to be built by Field Air. They're out of round engines now. And Quentin's about, oh, I don't know, he's older than me. He must be 68 or something. And has tried to retire about 10 times and finally did. Hube Volker, so that's, um, that's a, a, a younger, <laughs> 15 year ago Hube Volker. Door frames, um, so that's before the, all the, the um, so Hube and I used to go out, um, riveting's a two man job, as you'd know, and um, I'd finish on the shore at work on five o'clock, jump in my car, take me an hour to get to Ardmore. We'd grab a couple of bite to eat each and then often work through till midnight, one, two, riveting every, damn near every night for weeks and weeks. And there are just thousands of 
rivets that look like pinned pinheads. You know, they're a very small head rivet, very small sh uh, diameter shank, and because we had to put a special order in for the rivets, they had to remake them. They didn't make them now because it was a Lockheed special. The only way, they said, we're only going to do one length for you. So we thought we'll have to go long and cut them back. So I used to sit there in a seat with the little cutters and put a rivet in, snip, take that one out, put a rivet in, snip. And it's just thousands. So, but the trouble is you didn't know how long you needed until you needed it because some things had a doubler on it and that would have to be longer, you'd have to custom cut it to fit that. And so I'd used to bucket, um, Hobie didn't, didn't trust me to be on the, on, the, um, on the gun end. He said, he said if you slide off and we have to reskin that bit and we can't fix it. So, so that's the aeroplane, not my aeroplane, but one of the four that uh, land Chile, that's over Santiago. Uh, wing. So this is, this is a mistake if anyone ever gets into restoration. So this is a common practice to, um, to lay primer down before you put the rivets in. And that, the reason for that is so the head of the rivet's sitting on some primer and it's protected for corrosion. But unfortunately we made the mistake of leaving that about 10 years or 15 years before we took it off. And it had gone hard as the hobs of hell. And it just took buckets of acetone. I mean, we, we devised ways of wetting rags with acetone, laying it on, covering it with glad wrap and leaving it for a couple of hours. And you get there with a toothbrush. And, and because we're going polished, you couldn't get too aggressive with a toothbrush or you'd then spend hours polishing out the damage you'd just done. So that's the aeroplane when I first saw it in Wasilla. So it was in pretty bad bad shape. That was packing the centre section into the open top container. And you can see some of the museum's antiquated old forklifts and stuff we were using. That's me in a much younger with hair de-riveting the centre section. What happened to the hair? Oh, it just fell out with stress, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a yeah, that was the cockpit as, as I purchased the aeroplane, so it's, you know, it's totally different now. It was just snowing the whole time. You could work out there for a while, and then you just you, you couldn't use gloves because you're using hand tools and it just didn't work. And so you'd have to run and get a cup of coffee, hold the coffee in your hands, warm those up, back out again. And really short days. The sun wasn't coming up till about nine, and it was gone by three thirty. So. Um, hey, what about the instruments? Are they colour coded or are they all black and white? Uh, so the black and white, but we've what we've colour coded the flap. Um, flap speed ranges and VMCA and all that sort of stuff and red for do not exceed. Yep, yeah, they're all everything is green, you know, green, red, white for the, the numbers. So most of your basic structure is original. Yeah, yeah, ninety-five percent, I'd say. Oh, that's one of the Union aircraft. Union. So there's a good example. So you just will not find a colour photo of that anywhere. And so you can send, tell that that's either dark red or black, but just by the contrast, and that's a lighter colour. And somehow I found somewhere an old um, a luggage label or something, and that was, it was an orangey colour in there. And so that's we thought, oh well, no one's ever going to be able to quiz us on it so um, paint booth wasn't big enough and we didn't want to outsource it after the, after the um, pioneer incident with the wings so I just went to the cheapest place to buy that cheap Chinese pipe PVC pipe and we just built our own spray booth and just bought a big fan and, and put a big filter box on one end and sucky on the other end and that worked pretty well that's the engine being test run. These bits here, they all required English wheeling and shaping. So Hope and I decided to take the Mooney to Perth to go to the Red Bull air races. We thought, oh, let's go for, a, go for a jaunt. So we went there, Wangaratta in Australia, with all this in the back of the Mooney to drop off at the, to get, um, so it was air freighted straight to the, <laughs> straight to the English wheeling man. And, um, Oh, yes, before we packed up one. Oh, that's on the first trip. That's as far as we got. 
and there's the sort of you know everything doesn't look like much but it's it's a re you've got a risk in it you can't fix that it's not like a car um, yeah a lot of instruments were missing and um, Yeah, just you know, rot and water had got into various places. Interesting, that was another woodworking exercise. There's these cedar um, rings that go right around the cabin from one side to the other to attach the upholstery to with a tax. So you'd think it'd be easy, but they're all laminated. <laughs> so I was in, you'd spend hours there making a custom wood, identical custom wood frame to match the frame. Trace that onto a big piece of MDF or something, put a whole lot of blocks around it, get the clamps out and laminate up, laminate up these cedar um, hoops to go, and every one of them is different. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just weeks and weeks, months of work just doing that. And I only had to build one laminated bow for the cabin of the jackaroo. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this was about 15 of them. And yeah. Uh, yeah, no door. That was the interior when I got it, so that's really unusual to find the netting in place and that sort of thing. It's usually all well, that's just gone, and you know, some of the linings were gone. They had curtains, but they were not original. Um, some things like the the air ducts were missing. Some had just yeah you know, taken off with them. And you think it's such a small thing, but by the time you've made a a, a die to put in the rubber press just to recreate that. It's just it's weeks of work, weeks, and you're only missing one of them. And you can't buy them. You can't get them. You could make them out of fiberglass or something, but you still have to make a mould. So um, gives you a bit of insight to oh, a younger Stan Smith. Very much younger. Yeah. Stan That's when he did a, a, um, a filming thing for I don't know one of the New Zealand TV series. And they dyed his hair, but it went went um, <laughs> went the wrong colour. That's a reasonably recent photo. So that's in January this year. Um, so it's on its wheels, tail wheels on. Um, and we were doing fuel flow tests there. So we had to fill the tanks and make sure there's no leakage in any um, fuel pipes right through the cockpit, through the valves, before we put the outer wings on. So. We're at now, the airplane's in the hangar with um, wings on right through to the wingtips. Um, ailerons are on but still being rigged. Flaps um, are on and all the tail groups finished and on. So um, it's a matter of just fitting up the cowls now and we're um, almost there. New Zealand on one side and Lamb Chile on the other. Correct, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, that's, that's the bits that came back from Australia. That's the new ones. Yeah. Yeah, so there's the land chili side. Fantastic. So, yeah, that's, I don't know, people continue to ask me how much longer, how much longer, but I, I, you just don't know. It's Tuesday, 10 o'clock. Tuesday, 10 o'clock, yeah, yeah. And would I do it again? You just don't have enough life, you know? It's, if, if I hadn't started when I did, it wouldn't, yeah. you'd, you'd be selling it to someone else to finish. So, do we have any questions? Well, who are you going to get the test flight? Are you going to do it? Uh, Dave Phillips was going to do it, but he's lost his medical, so... Um, um, I've done a fair bit of flying with Matt Wakelin, and he flew the Lockheed 12 with me, and he's got a lot of Beach 18 time, but Matt lives in Australia now, so it's a bit more difficult. Um, don't know yet. When yeah. did Dave lose his medical? Oh, fairly recently. Mm -hmm. I th fairly recently, but... He got it, he got it back for the uh, RPL. He did the test yeah. flight on the Jackaroo. Yeah, but can't test flight. This is certified, so... Yeah. Where, where does the CAA, the regulator, fit in all this? Ah, uh, we just don't talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, we're, we've... We're, I mean, this is the first talk I've really done on it, because... Um, I mean... We get a lot of interest and due respect to the people that interest. They come in, they spend an hour talking to Hobie, and it's just an hour that work just didn't. Yeah, and and same with the regulator. You just don't want them asking a million questions and crawling over stuff. It's we'll present it when it's finished and and say here it is. Never. 
I hate the CAA, I hate the bullshit, I hate paperwork. It's not me. Yeah. And he, it's, it'll never stack up. The DC3, when I had it, I used to do a, a bit like that, and everyone would just scarper and leave you to clean the toilet and everything else, and you soon get sick of, sick of all that. You sold it to Craig, did you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not, not me, so I sold it to someone else, and they sold it to Craig, yeah. Anyone else? Hopefully there's no one from the CAA here, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not. Yeah. No, I mean, aviation, there's just too many regulations that, uh, you know, you know what I mean. Yeah. It's getting down to pedantic paperwork stuff that an eye wasn't dotted. It doesn't make flying the aeroplane any different. You know, the aeroplane doesn't know that the eye wasn't dotted. Yeah. Well, just to, to wrap up, I thank uh, Rob for an outstanding uh, review of what is a have to be a life's work to recreate a piece of uh, important New Zealand uh, aviation history. And uh, what could you say other than be impressed, congratulate him for his endurance, mm -hmm. and thank him for uh, preserving what is uh, an amazing aeroplane, an amazing piece of history. So join me, if you will, please, in thanking Rob for his uh, No, so and that's, it's easy to take people for rides for nothing. Yeah, that's what I do in the stem and everything else. People rock up. Oh, are you offering rides? I said, just jump in. I'll take you. <laughs> yeah. So we're, and the same with this. You know, people want to go for a ride. I'll say if we're going somewhere, I'll just climb in. So looking out uh, beyond um, beyond COVID, hoping it'll be level one next week. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, returning to face-to-face -face meetings like we're having tonight without the, without the uh, space seating, but with the back to butler and uh, our normal routine. So uh, out into uh, July, we're looking at uh, a week later than normal, uh, Tracy Cousins, who's a former C-130, um, I think she was a captain. She's resigned from the RNZ, went to the UK and come back, and she's now flying um, freight across the Tasman and so, so that'll be July and then uh, August Linton uh, Heatley will uh, tell us a bit about uh, flying in the other side of the world so this is uh, charter operations in uh, UK Europe and Scandinavia and most of us wouldn't uh, some of us will have had some of you, Bruce and others, will have got to the UK, but perhaps not uh, beyond into the, uh, the northern, that bit of the northern hemisphere. And then uh, our big uh, meeting for the year, which is the uh, Gene Batten uh, lecture, now called the Gene Batten Address, will be provided by the Aviation Historic Society with the president writing, who's in Washington, Brian Lockstone writing the lecture, and Paul Harrison from Parrot Param um, delivering the lecture, and the lecture is on uh, George Bolt, who uh, flew a hundred years ago in a Boeing uh, to land here in Tarawa in March the 14th. Uh, so it's pretty important that uh, we uh, pay him a bit of homage, and so that's the intention. Other bits for the rest of the year, we'll tell you those when they're coming, but uh, thank you very much for your time and your presence tonight and for enduring the COVID, which we've all done and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.